it was not easy for me to figure out what is the best response to the theme of the conference, especially in the format of a short uh, webinar presentation. Also, I think it would be right for you to wonder how I could address the issue of trust, justice, and reconciliation in the unique context of post apartheid South Africa, when I'm someone who grew up in the French-speaking Switzerland, lived now for over three decades in the US, and was never visited South Africa, and for that matter, none of any of the South Saharan countries of Africa. My only experience with the African continent has been limited to North Africa. There I have spent quite a bit of time uh, visiting several countries. I also have some family members and for my extended family uh, who are from Morocco. And I have been teaching contextual therapy uh, fairly extensively in uh, Algeria uh, for uh, a couple of years. Uh, and this has given me a good experience of the, South, the North African circumstances, but it has not done give me any experience of Africa in general. So to compensate for that, I've done a lot of readings that were recommended in, specifically by Haneke Merling. But unfortunately, I do not believe that any readings can prepare me uh, to this conference as would have been an actual visit to South Africa. So I have to be modest in my goals and accept these limitations. And I hope that you as participants will always also be able to accept these limitations. But my plan is to try my best. And so now I move to my actual presentation. So today, my goal is to explain to explore the role of group loyalties in the context of transgenerational solidarity. And the question is like this, is group loyalty an obstacle to transgenerational solidarity or can it become a resource? Group loyalties can become an obstacle first in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation, and then it can be an obstacle to transgenerational solidarity, especially if this solidarity is understood as a solidarity that extends beyond, beyond the family lines and includes intergroup solidarity. So it is understandably a huge challenge for groups that have been the victims of oppressions, violence for generations, to care about the welfare of the groups that have been at the source of these injustices. But there is also a challenge for the groups that have believed in their superiority or special rights how can this group truly care about the rights and needs of groups that they have considered as inferiors? And for that reason, uh, how can the groups that have the, been the victims and the group that have been the victimizers truly work for a common future, truly work for a common transgenerational solidarity. And here, I believe that this issue is not just limited to, uh, to South Africa. I believe that there are many other circumstances in many other countries where these issues can be raised. But obviously, in South Africa, these challenges have been addressed directly through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and later through other several commissions that have worked in the same direction. So what are these obstacles from the point of view of contextual therapy? 
from the point of view of contextual therapy, there are two kinds of obstacles to transgenerational solidarity. Two kinds of obstacles to, especially to intergroup solidarities. Two obstacles are first, the obstacles that come from destructive entitlement. And second, the obstacles that come from group loyalty. So what I would like to try today is to show that in both cases, there is also a path towards hope. And more specifically, I would like to show that group loyalties can become a resource rather than an obstacle when it comes to intergroup solidarity. So let's start with families. So within families, the obstacle to transgenerational solidarity comes mostly from destructive entitlement and parentification, not so much from family loyalties, which of course, family loyalties, of course, an example of group loyalties, but here family loyalties do not create as much as an obstacle as it could in the situation of uh, group loyalties in groups that are not based on family relationships. So to start with this subject, one of the simplest ways to assess health and pathologies in families is in fact to assess the direction of giving and receiving between parent and children. What I mean here is that parents should be able to give to their children and children should be able to receive from their parents. It sounds quite logical, but it doesn't always happen. So here, in fact, transgenerational solidarity is a result of a healthy chain of giving and receiving between the generations, a healthy chain in which the parents are the givers and the children are the receivers. Parents can give, children can receive. Now, by this, it's very important to, to, to note that by this, I don't mean that parents can always meet the needs of their children. Many parents do live in difficult circumstances and they don't, simply don't have the means to give to their children what every child should receive according, for instance, to the declaration of the child's rights, which points out the rights of children to food, water, education, uh, protection from exploitation, and many other points. You know, in the situation where parents cannot provide this, uh, need, cannot meet these needs of their children or cannot meet their rights, uh, often it comes to situation where both the parents and the children are victim from what we would call in contextual therapy, distributive injustices, meaning injustices that comes from the way, the place where they are living, are they living in an area that is affected by, uh, by uh, hunger, an area that is affected by wars, uh, an area where a group is discriminated uh, against another, et cetera, et cetera. So in those circumstances, the parents themselves are not directly responsible for the injustices, but both parents and children are the victims of these injustices. And here, for I think probably by the first time or maybe the second time only, I'm going to provide a new terminology that I am now going to use in contextual therapy, which is to propose that the, the notion of distributive injustice can be maybe better expressed in using the term situational injustices. Situational injustices that are not caused by anybody specifically, but that affects a whole group of people. So in the circumstances of what I would call now situational injustices, as long as the parents do their very best to meet 
their children's needs, they will remain trustworthy. I mean, parents would try their best are still giving to the children and the flow of giving and receiving still flows from the parents to the children. The parent will try to give the best to the children who will receive the best that the parents can give, even if it's not enough. In short, these children as such, they will be the victims of many situational injustices, but they will not be the victim of these retributive injustices, or which is a normal um, wording in contextual therapy. And here I also will use a new terminology and I propose to replace, I mean, to at least add to that notion of retributive justice, a synonymous that is maybe easier to understood, which is relational injustices. So in that way, children who have been the victim of these situational injustices that the parent will be also victim of are not directly the victim of the parents' wrongdoings, or in other terms, they are not the victims of relational injustices. And that makes a difference for children because children will retain a much better capacity to take care, to care about the welfare of the next generations than children who have the added experience of both situational injustices and relational injustices, or even the children who are just the victims of relational injustices, not situational injustices. And in the parent-child relationship, the most frequent example of relational injustices is related to the parentification of the child. So when parents have experienced injustices in their own life, whether it's distributive situational injustices or past relational injustices that occur between them and the parents, they may be tempted to turn to the children to get compensated for these past injustices. So for instance, parents may turn to the children to get the love and the understanding that they had not received from their own parents. And this is the, one of the most common forms of parentification of the next generation. So as soon as parents parentify the children, then the children become the givers and the parents become the receivers. And that leads to a reversal in the flow of giving and receiving between the generations. And it comes also a resource, a, a source, sorry, not a resource, a source of individual and relational pathologies. Because children who are parentified accumulate destructive entitlement. Some develop conduct disorders, which is defined as an inability to care about the right of others, which to my eyes is a clear manifestation of destructive entitlement. But most commonly, parentification needs to a continued reversal in the giving and receiving between the generation, and consequently, to a lack of ability to care about the interests of the future generations. So in other words, parentification in itself can often become a source of a lack of transgenerational solidarity. Um, since a lot of you have heard the principle of contextual therapy, who are either presenters or audience for this conference, I was not sure if I need to add a little bit more about destructive entitlement, but I just may just add this, that when people are the victim of injustices, they have a right to expect redress for these injustices. That's logical. If you are, if you are wronged, you expect redress. It's normal. Now, the problem is that if the redress the, rest, the reparation does not come from the person who has committed the injustice, then the risk is that you will not give up your claims, 
but then turn your claims towards others, we in a way have nothing to do with this injustice. So like you may turn the claim that, uh, that for redress uh, after you have been used by a parent or not received from a parent towards a spouse or towards your colleagues, for instance. But in those cases, pretty quickly people will notice that they didn't cause the damage and send you back to your story. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not your parents. I didn't create this. If you have a problem with your parent, go back to them. You know, that's not my issue. Unfortunately, children cannot say that. Children are entirely dependent on their parents emotionally, practically. Children are loyal to their parents. Children have a tendency to give to their parents. So then they cannot just send the parents back and say, hey, this is not my problem, just go back to your parents. But they in fact respond to this expectation of the parents to get something back from someone for the injustices that they've incurred. And this is really where parents, the children get damaged and parents are blind to this use of their children because in many ways, they think that they are just asking for what they, what they, they are entitled to get, you know, like love and affection. Yes, you are entitled to get love and affection. Now, to extract love and affection from a child when yourself are not able to give as much to this child, then becomes unfair. And there where the parents become blind. So the blindness is a big factor in destructive entitlement that explain why people tend to use third parties to get back what they didn't give, receive from people who have hurt them. So in many ways, uh, and many people here also know that the hope for change in those situations comes from the definition of the healing moment in contextual therapy and of the definition of constructive entitlement. In, in another word, it means that parents can be helped to discover that they can gain more for themselves in the forms of increased self-worth, increased self-esteem, and increased uh, autonomy even, if they can take the risk of meeting the needs of the children. So in short, the help here comes, the goal here is to help people to earn entitlement as an antidote to the accumulated destructive entitlement. So that comes also from the strategy, which is at the core of contextual therapy, which is multi-directed partiality. And uh, here, uh, I would like to use the example of a teen mother uh, to show how we can move from this destructive entitlement to a possible earning of constructive entitlement as an example of a move that could occur also in other circumstances or not just parents. So in brief, she was, a parent, she was parentified during most of her childhood. Uh, she lived in a situation uh, with poverty, of drug use of the parents, very many difficult situations, and she was a caregiver for her siblings for all growing up. So she was dreaming to leave home as soon as possible and to have a baby. That was one of the main goals. In her mind, the baby would give her the love that she had not received growing up. She would have also that affection that she did not receive. So in, in some ways, her destructive entitlement and her need to parentify a baby is what pushed her to have a baby. And uh, even became she, even before she became a parent. So in a strange way, the reverse direction in the giving and receiving between parent and child was already established before the child was born. So that's very, an important point, I think, for everybody to remember that this desperate hope for being loved by a child is a very frequent factor in teen pregnancies. 
And not, that's not that there are accidents, but that somehow they are, these teens really hope to get pregnant, to have the baby who would love them. So to come back to this girl, as first she was very delighted by her baby daughter, but soon she realized that she would have to be responsible for her care. She didn't want that. So as she became uh, neglectful, she lost the custody of her daughter, who was placed with a paternal aunt. The girl's father was in jail and ready to accept the adoption, but she was not. So the adoption judge set the limit. Either she was able to demonstrate that she can work to become a better parent by attending parenting classes, by visiting her daughter regularly, or he would terminate and uh, rights and finalize his adoption. So I met her as a consultant to the homeless shelter where they was living. Staff was puzzled by her ambivalence and uh, she, they felt that she, they didn't understand why she would not meet the uh, judge's requirements since he was telling that she wanted to keep the right to uh, the custody, to, her, to re regain the custody of her daughter. So when I met her, I was able to acknowledge that in fact, if she was following the judge's requirement and became more responsible parents, it would mean that she would have to serve years as a responsible parent twice. So she has already served years as, as functioning as a responsible parent for her siblings, and now she would be expected to spend years functioning as a responsible parent for her daughter. That it was not just, uh, just coming here and there to visit her, but she would have to become a responsible parent for the years to come. So she has actually only two choices. Either she could decide that she had done enough, and the judge will terminate her parental rights, or she would have to decide to give twice. So in brief, my work there was to acknowledge the injustices that she has incurred in the being parentified while she was growing up. But at the same time, I was asking her to recognize that her daughter had also a right to consistent parenting by a reliable adult. So she had to make a decision between those two options, either to give twice or to lose her daughter. And after a week of thinking, she said that she was willing to work towards, to meet the judge expectation and she had registered two parental classes. But that of course is not the end of the story. To be in custody, she would have to be available for a daughter. She will to be able to secure housing, et cetera. But, and a contextual therapist would also have to work with uh, the daughter's right to have a consistent relationship with his aunt who had been available to her and not also forget neither the aunt or the father. So this is not the subject for today. But the point here today in our meeting is to remind us that it is possible to, re to remotivate parents to give to their children this, despite the destructive entitlement. So when it comes to families and transgenerational solidarity, the source of hope is that transgenerational solidarity does not require altruism, since at the end, the parent who is helped to give makes an indirect gain in the form of constructive entitlement. And also, as I mentioned before, loyalty is not an obstacle to transgenerational solidarity in families. That is because in families where parents care about the next generations, the next generation will have a better chance to maintain the existence over time, which is not the case in families where parents don't care about, are unable to provide consistent care to their children. In these families where children are parentified from generations to generations, the, the continuity of the family may be threatened in different ways. For instance, Children may be placed out of the family in foster care. They may be adopted out of the family, which of course threatened the continuity of the family. And many children was, who have difficulties, uh, uh, who have been parentified, may also have difficulties in building their own family, which is a threat, another threat to the continuity of families. So in many ways, to give a chance to the future, we need to examine our parents' behaviors 
in the light on the, of the impact of the next gen, on the next generation. For instance, we, should, we have to choose to put an end to destructive ways of relating when it occurs in families. And when we are putting away destructive ways of relating, we are not disloyal to our parents because we give a better chance to the future, a better chance to our children to succeed in their life and become good parents. And this is the essence of what is described in contextual therapy as a mandate for posterity. Well, here comes the problem. How can one generation define what is good for the next one? There are no feedback mechanisms between the generation, no control system that could regulate the interaction between us and posterity. We, may, we must anticipate the needs of posterities based on our own experience. We must do the best to protect in inter its interests, but who can be the judge who tells if we have succeeded or not? And here comes another notion in, that is very important in contextual therapy, which is the notion of the intrinsic tri transgenerational tribunal of solidarity. I repeat, the intrinsic transgenerational tribunal of solidarity. And many people have abbreviated this notion as the transgenerational tribunal. Then it loses two central characteristics. Even if this tribunal may sound just as a metaphor, in fact, it's inherent to any relationships. When we spoke about the spiral of destructive entitlement, constructive and destructive entitlement, we don't talk about just two people, a giver and a receiver, or a taker and an exploited one. Over time, more and more people get affected by the consequences of these uh, actions of the two people, what, of the action that are at the origin of this spiral. So here the tri tribunal function, we can almost use the image as a sort of constant background scanning of fairness in all of these relationships. And the second characteristics of this tribunal is that the judge is solidarity. Are, the, are we cap capable of solidarity or are we not capable of solidarity? And here solidarity is not just limited to future members of our families or to the group we belong to. It does extend to intergroup solidarity and to solidarity with all the inhabitants of our planet, including to, to a certain degree even to living creatures that have inhabit pl our planet, not just to human beings. So in short, solidarity becomes synonymous with universal solidarity and universal uh, responsibility in many ways in the lines of and Hans Jonas imperative of responsibility. So we have seen that in families, loyalty is not an obstacle to transgenerational solidarity, but it's not so true of group loyalties. When people have been victim of oppression, discrimination, violence caused by members of another group, they face issues that are not entirely different than the people who have been mistreated in their families. As victims of injustice, of severe injustices, they are entitled to be recognized as victims. Victims will deserve redress. And if this recognition does not come from the people who have committed the injustices, then they accumulate destructive entitlement and this entitlement may lead them to commit injustices themselves. And in fact, in the fact that people who have been the victim of injustices are pushed to turn into people who lose the ability to care about the right of others in my eyes, is one of the most, the biggest injustices uh, and one of the biggest destructive consequences of injustices. I repeat that people who have been wronged and caught in the predicament of destructive entitlement are bound then to commit new injustices 
And this is a very sad situation that the people who are victim now become also victimizers. It, and that's a, one of the saddest consequences of injustices that are not repaired. So to move out of this sad predicament, these people will need to discover that they can gain something for themselves when they try to show generosity to others and when they try they refrain to claim their dues at the cost of hurting people. So in other words, people who have been wronged can decide that you can, they can try to take the risks of re-engaging in the spiral of this constructive entitlement, or if they don't take these risks, they will remain stuck in the spiral of destructive entitlement. So here, the hope for the future comes from the fact that generosity does not require altruism, since at the end, the people who accept to show generosity to others, accept to care about others, will earn constructive entitlement. And this will also here shows as an increase of self-worth, self-definition, self-esteem. But here, group loyalty can become an obstacle, especially if generosity relates to forgiveness. As in, at an individual level, members of a group that has been victimized may come to the realization that it's better for them to forgive the people who have made them suffer than to live in a life that is controlled by anger and by resentment. So from this point of view, forgiveness can lead to a gain for the person who forgives. But at the same time, the person who is forgiven make a gain too. So the groups that have been victimized may have a hard time to accept that some of their group members uh, care about the care to forgive the group of the opposite side. And so the group members who are ready to move towards forgiveness of the other group members may be accused of disloyalty. And this accusation of disloyalty can in turn become an obstacle to forgiveness and reconciliation. And then consequently also to intergroup solidarity. So the question now is, where can this hope come from? That things can be, that this intergroup solidarity is possible. To answer this question, we have to understand that loyalty can also become a source of autonomy and resilience that can open us to strangers without having to be disloyal to our families and to our communities. How does this work? So to understand this, we have to need to go back to the definition of loyalty. As most of you know, in contextual therapy, loyalty is based on fairness and reciprocity. We repay people who have been committed to us by a similar commitment. We commit to place the interests before the interest of people who have show, not shown us a similar similarity of commitment. So when it comes to group loyalty, it's based on our commitment to place the interest of the group that has been committed to us before the interest of any other groups. So in short, the main characteristic of loyalty is its triadical nature, triadic nature. It establishes a triangle between us who have to make a choice, the group that we choose to commit to, and all the other groups. So what is really important to remember is that from a systemic point of view, loyalty establishes a boundary between the groups that we favor and all the other groups. So as a result, loyalty serves as a stabilizing factor for this group and the stability of the group, our group, may be threatened when we start to offer our loyalty to any other groups. So in family loyalty, in families, the stress is, the stress, the threat, sorry, the, the, the threat is less because in families, families are bound by many more ties than loyalties, by bond blood ties, by attachment, but in non-family groups, 
the stability of the group is based essentially on its member willingness to continue to be part of this group. So we can say that, in other words, non-family group depend essentially on the loyalty of its group and or on the loyalty of its group to remain member of this group. So without this loyalty of the group, these groups may not survive over time. So as a consequence, when our groups are threatened by changes, the more the group, our group is threatened by changes, the more it will have to rely on our loyalty to retain its integrity. And often we will be proven to our loyalty to the group by using the terms us versus them. Because indeed, each time we talk in terms of us versus them, we are redef redefining the boundaries of our group. And in some ways then we are securing its homeostasis. So this is the reason why groups can be easily threatened when a group member makes a gesture towards the group, the members of another group, especially if this group have been seen as enemies before. Because this gesture reopens the boundaries that separate these two groups. And this sort of reopening of boundaries by this gesture, bridging over this boundary, is then be becoming a threat to the continuity of this group. So the more the groups are threatened by changes, or our group is threatened by changes in its environment, the more this group will have to insist on the loyalty of its members to secure its continuity. So in South Africa, as in many countries of the world, an important threat to the continuity of groups have come from globalization. But in South Africa, it seems that all groups have also been affecting, affected, not just by globalization, but mostly also by all the changes that were brought about by the end of apartheid and by the move towards reconciliation. So it would not be surprising to see that groups, that group loyalty has become an obstacle to the building of a common future. Because indeed these groups were sort of brought together towards those changes and each of these group uh, homeostasis was threatened by those changes. But loyalty can also become a resource if it can, we can allow its group members to express the loyalty in a di direct ways, in direct ways. And if they can do so, then it will not require, require to shunt other members of other groups. So I don't know enough about South Africa to know in detail how can people can express the loyalty to the group in a direct manner but a few things come to my mind. For instance, I am aware about the number of languages in South Africa, and language can serve as a, law, as a vehicle of direct loyalty to a group. So people would promote the, the language of the native group or promote some traditions that come from the native groups, will be able then to reinforce the boundaries of this group in a direct manner, but this way, it would not require putting down other groups. So as the group is reinforced by this direct offering of loyalties, then it becomes less likely to be threatened when other groups, when some of its group members engage in positive interaction with other groups. In short, it means that people who can, it can express their loyalty to their group in a direct and positive fashion will feel less disloyal to the group than people who have rejected the heritages uh, of their own groups, like who have not cared to maintain its language, to learn its language and ad adopted the language of other groups, or people who have abandoned traditions that were common in the group, for instance. 
So people who are freer to express loyalty in a direct way will also be freer to engage positively with other groups. And in addition, people who offer the loyalty in a direct manner will also earn the, uh, a constructive entitlement, and that will also allow them to be freer to, express, to engage in, to, in new uh, situations, freer to uh, follow their own goals, and for instance, freer to engage in the goal of working cooperatively with other groups. Now, people can also express their loyalties through many other channels. For instance, at the time of sport competitions, many people who have been otherwise having not too much in common with other groups may join together as a national group in expression support for their national team. And they can then be brought together by pride that will eliminate those boundaries. So I'm pretty sure for South Africa that the 2010 Soccer World Championship was a source of common pride for many South Africans. And I'm pretty sure that for that period, at least they join in a common loyalty to the South Africa as a country and to the national team, no matter what group they belong to. So in my eyes, this example shows that a common pride can bring people together and this becomes a resource that allow people to work together cooperatively beyond the boundaries of their own groups. So in conclusion, I really do believe that we cannot just seek hope, but that we can find hope in the in find hope for the future, exactly through these notions, which are at the core of contextual therapy, which is a notion of earning constructive entitlement as an antidote to destructive entitlement, and the notion that group loyalty can turn into a resource that allows us the freedom to engage in positive intergroup relationship, especially when we can offer our loyalty to our family and to our groups in a direct and non-destructive way, rather than by expressing it by fighting other groups. So in short, yes, I do believe that there is a hope that we can move from a us against them attitude towards a we all, we all working together to a common future. And this is what I will wish for all of us. And thank you very much for your attention.